you're listening to the Telltale channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk about failed political candidate Candace Taylor, babies, guns, and Jesus woman herself, claiming election fraud in the Republican Party. Hank Kuhneman, prophet of God, explaining why he was actually right when he prophesied that Trump would win the 2020 election, and he's right now when he says Trump will get two additional terms. Prophet Mario Murillo telling us that Satan showed up in his bedroom one night and told him he was going to gender bend his kids. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send an email instead, the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hey, I'm from California. I just wanted to share a personal story. Uh, I have a profile on a dating website, and the other day this one girl, or this one woman, I should say, texted me just so she could insult me for being an atheist. Dating as an atheist is very hard, and I take personal offense to the fact that Christians claim that they're the ones being persecuted when they're the ones persecuting us this way. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that story. I really like your show. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate that. Atheists really are persecuted. Pagans are also persecuted terribly. Evangelicals, Christian extremists, are technically the minority. I think they are a minority in the country, but they are the, they're the group in power, despite being a minority. It's kind of like rich people. Rich people are a vast minority. There are not anywhere near as many rich people in the U.S. or in the world, as there are poor people in the U.S. or the world. But they are the people in power. They call all the shots, they control everything, and they persecute the people who aren't like them, basically. It doesn't really bother me generally, but something that does bother me deeply is being persecuted for being an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Like, Jehovah's Witnesses persecuting me, treating me like shit because... I'm an ex-Jehovah's Witness, disrespecting me, hating me, thinking that I'm inferior to them inherently because I left the religion and, and no other reason. You don't really understand what it's like to be persecuted until you're persecuted. For me, the, the first experience that I ever had with persecution, the pain that you get from that, was from being hated for being disfellowshipped. But since then, I've had some experiences with it from being an atheist, because people just hate me, because I don't believe like them, or whatever else. I was also persecuted as a Jehovah's Witness, of course. There are a lot of Christians out there who hate Jehovah's Witnesses. It just sucks, man. It just sucks. And everybody who has to deal with this kind of thing needs to be in the same boat together. We have to support each other and work together. Everybody. LGBT people, atheists, pagans, all of us, we need to get together and work together to try to protect each other and help each other in any way we can to shield each other from the persecution that we deal with. Being straight and white and male, I have to deal with significantly less persecution than the vast majority of the rest of the community, I would say. But I do still actually understand what it's like, and it is not fun. Hi, Owen. Uh, my name is Genesis. And yes, believe me, the concept of an atheist named Genesis, the irony is not lost on me. Uh, before I continue, let me just say, I had a friend whose last name was Anderson. He would constantly, constantly, every person he met at the pizza shop, at the grocery store, everybody would say, Mr. Anderson, like they're in the fucking Matrix. Like he hasn't heard that joke 60,000 times. Oh my God. It must be the most frustrating thing in the world to hear the same joke over and over and over again. And I understand that, and for that reason, I wasn't going to say a word about your name. So thank you for preempting the joke. I've got your back. You don't have to worry. Let's keep listening. Genesis, the irony is not lost on me. Uh, the question that I have for you is, especially now with the Roe versus Wade thing, 
people are making the comparison of The Handmaid's Tale. And normally I would chalk that up to being a conspiracy theory, but as we know, evangelicals and the like would very much love this country to be a theocracy. Do you think something like The Handmaid's Tale is a possibility? Because even though I don't generally subscribe to conspiracy theories, I could actually kind of see it happening. What do you think? Thanks. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. I've never actually seen The Handmaid's Tale or read it, so I don't know what it's about. But evangelicals tell us exactly what they want. They tell us the ideal world that they would like to live in. There isn't really a logical flow to what they're trying to do. Like, for example, if they believe that a three-day-old embryo is an actual person, logically, if they want to reduce abortions, then they should encourage birth control, right? That's how you reduce abortions, encourage birth control. No, that, that's not what they do. That's not what they want. Their belief system does not have a logical flow. Not only do they want to completely eliminate abortion, they want to eliminate birth control, too nonsensically it isn't about saving a life quote unquote it was never about that it was always about controlling people's behavior and they don't want anybody to sleep with anybody period unless their intent is to have a child their backwards views of society match up with what i've been told the handmaid's tale is like i said never read it never seen it but i don't consider it a conspiracy theory when you can look at the things that they believe and the things that they want and match it up one to one for what our worst fears were in the first place so your question is, is The Handmaid's Tale realistic? That's what they want. Will they get it? I don't think they're going to get that. I mean, people walking around all covered up and everything. I, I deeply doubt they're going to go all the way there. They do want it, though, and they will continue to fight for it until they get it. Uh, so take that for what you will. Every win that they get, they take another step back and say, now we want this. So we just have to keep fighting. That's the point. We have to keep fighting no matter what. Hi, Owen. My name is Tom. Thank you again, buddy. I really appreciate all you do. I like how you go after these phony healers and these phony preachers such as Copeland. There's also Benny Hinn. And, uh, Benny Hinn. I know. I have not covered the dude enough. I need to cover him more. In fact, I should probably do a Sunday long-form video on him. Yeah, that, that guy is something else. And others who have simply faked their healing. And like you say, I say it's sinful and wicked. Thank you so much for going after these knuckleheads. Blessings, brother. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. These people are very, very disingenuous and underhanded, and, and some of the things that they do, it's just dirty. It is absolutely dirty. That being said, I actually got an, a second voicemail from this guy immediately after the first one. I'm not going to play it. I don't, I don't know that he would want me to play it, but it was a Cheyenne blessing from the Cheyenne Nation, basically. It was like a prayer from, I believe, a native tribe i thought that was kind of interesting i appreciate that it was really interesting and of course i don't believe it but i appreciate the sentiment very much so thank you so much for sending that in next one is an email and it came from haunted shadows legacy title is question about commercial cults what's up owen i go by haunted shadows legacy on twitch and youtube you can just refer to me as haunted or hsl if you want Thought I'd slip in this question for you about commercial cults. I know you tend to focus on political and religious cults, but I've also had experience with the commercial types. Have you considered looking into commercial cults? I'm talking about ones based on multi-level marketing, MLM for short, such as Young Living, Dutera, Monat, or Monet, I think, Monet, something or other, Tupperware, and Unique. While political and, wait, is Tupperware an MLM? I thought that was just the name of a product that you buy at a store. Turn my world upside down right now, HSL. While political and religious cults have a profound, noticeable, and direct effect on a victim's mental state and behavior, commercial cults seem more subtle and insidious. The commercial aspect can even drive some people into deep debt. There's also significant crossover between religion and MLMs. Thought it'd be worth bringing up just for spreading the word, if nothing else. By the way, here's a fun fact. Because they're so slow, sloths can hold their breath underwater for around 40 minutes. See you in the live stream. Have a good one. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, MLMs are definitely classified as cults. The guy that wrote the bite model, Stephen Hassan, 
has talked about multi-level marketing schemes at length. They use a lot of supernatural claims to manipulate and control people, and they do a lot of the same control techniques as more traditional cults like Jonestown and Heaven's Gate and stuff like that. So yeah, MLMs definitely qualify as cults without a shadow of a doubt, especially Young Living. That one's right at the top of my list. I've done a video about them before, but it may be on Genetically Modified Skeptics channel. I think we did a video about them together, or maybe I did one and then he did one. I don't remember. Anyways, yeah. He was adversely affected by Young Living, and I talked about them for that reason when we originally met, I think. So anyway, yeah, thank you so much for the email. That is an important subject to cover. I just haven't talked about MLMs enough. Uh, I probably should more than I do, though. Next question is from Jennifer from Georgia. Title is Question for Fireside Chat. Hi, Owen. I love your channel. My question for you is this. If Jehovah's Witnesses have such a problem with the education system and things like birthdays and holidays, the Pledge of Allegiance, and discourage higher education, why don't they operate their own private schools? Is it because they want their kids to act as missionaries in the public school system? Is it logistically not possible? Thanks for your work and keep it up. Kind regards, Jennifer from Georgia. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> now, I think it's um, probably a logistical problem. I think they're trying to keep costs down, especially now. They're trying to find more efficient ways of disseminating information to people, and they don't want to... They want everything that their people do to be on a volunteer basis. If they had schools of their own, Jehovah's Witnesses, they'd have to hire people to do certain work. Right now, everything that they have can be on a volunteer basis. Bethel, on the other hand, they don't pay people, usually, to work at Bethel, I don't believe. Bethel is like their cult compound, their headquarters where you live and work every single day. They don't pay you to live there, as far as I know. They give you a stipend for food sometimes, I believe, but they supply the living space, the dorm or whatever. That's considered your stipend, or that's considered your pay, just living in their dorms. They also pay missionaries, or they used to at the very least. When I was little, they would pay missionaries to go overseas and work or whatever else, but I think they want to keep their costs down generally. That's my guess for why they don't open private schools. And also, I think they're mostly okay with the education that kids get from public schools. They just want to supplement it with more information. Like, they don't accept evolution, obviously, as the fact that it is. And they don't accept a lot of other scientific stuff, but for the most part, they're okay with them learning about math and things like that. I think it's probably a financial barrier to entry. That would be my guess. Next email is from First Amendment News. The title is Rejoice for the End is Near? Question mark. Hello, and thank you for everything you do. I would like to know if you think that overturning Roe v. Wade could end the GOP as we know it. I believe you did a video a while ago explaining how the evangelical church became so intertwined with the GOP. While the evangelicals do have their hot-button issues, it is the anti-abortion movement that binds them together and ties them to the GOP. If this is the case, what will be their next big cause? It's a really good point, and it's a point that I brought up uh, a year ago, maybe, somewhere in there. I pointed out that Trump controlled the government, every aspect of the government, for the first two years of his term, he had the Supreme Court, the Senate, the House, and the, the executive branch, the presidency. And abortion wasn't abolished at the time. Weird, right? Why wasn't abortion abolished at the time? You would think that they would reform the U.S. into what they wanted it to look like if they controlled every branch of the government like that. I suspected that they weren't going to change anything about abortion because they can use it as a donation tool. They can use it as something to get people whipped into a blood frenzy to donate harder, basically. But lo and behold, here we are, they're erasing Roe v. Wade. I guess maybe they just didn't have the votes that they needed to get it done at the time. That's my guess. Anyway, let's keep reading the email. I don't think the anti-woke slash anti-CRT movement is going to withstand the test of time, mainly because most evangelicals don't know what CRT is, and it's very hard to get people to continue to fight for or against a cause they don't understand. The anti-LGBTQ movement is a non-starter. While they might be able to protest against LGBTQ people in some cases, most Americans know and respect people who identify as LGBTQ. They won't want to be involved in, many, in any meaningful way with protesting against LGBTQ rights. 
I think I agree with you on that point. They may focus their attention on the school voucher program they keep trying to push. I don't see how this could ever get past the separation of church and state. I know they may start schools that don't teach the Bible or try to teach religion from a historical perspective with a strong emphasis on Christianity, but could this fight bring them to the polls in the numbers that they need? My point is that if anti-abortion brought them together then overturning Roe v. Wade might not make them stronger and could be the beginning of the end for the evangelical GOP partnership. I appreciate the email. Thank you for sending it to me, First Amendment News. Here's my take on it. I don't think abortion is the thing that tied them to it. I don't think that anti-LGBT sentiment was either, or CRT or anti-woke anything. You know what I think bring ties them together? The style of messaging, the rhetoric that they use. I think the thing that links them is hating and fearing anything at all. All the Republican Party needs to do is point in a direction and the evangelical voting bloc will go running. They'll freak out. They'll lose their minds. Every pastor from here to Texas in evangelical churches will talk about this thing that they've fabricated as being a huge problem. They don't need to lean on being anti-woke or anti-CRT or anti-LGBT or anti-abortion or any of that. They don't need to lean on any of it, really. They just need to lean into the rhetoric. That is it. That's my take on it. And I appreciate the email. It was an interesting question. Next, we're going to talk about failed political candidate Candace Taylor, babies, guns, and Jesus woman herself, claiming election fraud in the Republican primary. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Candace Taylor was running against Brian Kemp in the Georgia gubernatorial race. She was trying to become the governor or the nominee to be governor. She lost. She only got 3.4% of the vote in the Republican primary. And guess what she's doing now? She's claiming election fraud in the Republican primary, of course. But she had some weird campaign ideas that she decided to go with, so... I wanted to go through some of her campaign videos, some of her suggestions for how she'd clean up Georgia and all that stuff. Let's just take a look at this interesting, this interesting campaign video that she put out. Uh, This was early May 2022 when she released this. Check this out. They told us what they wanted to do. Some might even say they had to get our permission. When she says they had to get our permission, I think what she means is they had to get the consent of the governed. She's kind of alluding to the idea that the governed should withdraw their consent to be governed anymore. It's a libertarian, far-right extremist idea. To at least tell us ahead of time, even if we didn't believe them. Okay, it's looking pretty ominous and weird currently. Notice what she's doing. This is propaganda, by the way. It's a political ad, but it is propaganda in the truest sense. Everything that you see in this, every scene that you see is intended to give you a very specific idea, a very specific view of who she is and what she wants. Showing her hand on the steering wheel with a wedding ring implies that she's in favor of one man, one woman type of marriage. You know, it's like I said, it's propaganda. And it was very specifically set up in specific ways to propagandize to you. Over four billion people have been injected with something that took just nine months to create. Again, this is propaganda. That's not exactly correct. What she's talking about here, obviously, is the vaccine. It may have taken nine months to create. In fact, I I think it took significantly less time because we'd been experimenting with mRNA technology since like the 80s or something like that. But we did a massive amount of testing on it to ensure that it was safe. It's been tested on a mass scale at this point, if nothing else, and it has been found to be perfectly safe. In fact, I was one of the first people to get it. 
the moment it was available for me, I got the vaccine and I'm perfectly fine. I think it's strange that the far right continued to quadruple down on the idea that the vaccine is dangerous, despite the fact that their hero, Trump, has been endorsing the vaccine this entire time. I just think that's strange. Again, it's propaganda. I feel like I need to debunk every word out of her mouth. I can't just let this stuff go. What we're looking at here on screen is something called the Georgia Guidestones, and we'll get into what that is in just a second, but it's very, very relevant. If you haven't heard of this conspiracy, it is a doozy. Just bear with me and we'll get there. Ask yourself why. Why what? What am I asking myself? Back in biblical times, human sacrifice was a form of demonic worship. Here's where the conspiracy theories really come in full swing. If you're an atheist watching this, you probably have heard the atheists eat babies joke. We say that joke a lot, but it really isn't a joke. People genuinely do believe that. In fact, it was propaganda against the Jewish people back in the 40s. People genuinely really did believe that Jewish people and atheists Eight babies. No joke. And she's calling back to that kind of thing right here. Human sacrifice. There's a cabal out there of evil Satan worshipers that eat babies and do human sacrifices and all that stuff. This is QAnon talking points, but QAnon is really just a rehashing of old conspiracy theories that have been around for centuries that were picked back up in the 1940s against the Jewish people and picked up again in the intervening years to be used against anybody that far-right conservatives have hated. It's been like this for centuries. Back in biblical times, human sacrifice was a form of demonic worship. We're still doing it in present day by killing our unborn. It's the same demons. It's the again, propaganda. Underlying what she's saying here is the implication that people get abortions in the first place as a form of satanic worship. This is part of our religious service or our religious practices is to get abortions. It gets even weirder. Just keep listening. Same demons. It's the same sacrifice. It's the, the same demons. She believes there are demons roving about right now, possessing people and forcing them to do these satanic rituals or whatever, to sacrifice their friends and family to Satan. Demons, it's the same sacrifice, it's the same sin, it's just a different time. This is a long shot in and of itself, running for governor against an incumbent. Why are you doing this? If we don't call things out and we don't acknowledge them and we don't take authority and take dominion over what God's given us, then we are no better than the evil ones that put it up. So she wants to, she is a Christian nationalist and she wants to take control of the state in the name of Jesus. If this was a thousand years ago, she would be a crusader. She has the crusader mindset. She wants to take over by force if necessary. That's where her head is at. Luckily, like I said, she lost the election. She isn't going to be the governor. She only got three and a half percent of the vote or something like that. But again, it doesn't end there. The story doesn't end there. Keep watching. We've watched as people have destroyed our history and monuments. Monuments are not our history. Those monuments that they're pulling down, I don't know what those are. They're probably slave owners, I'm guessing, and I'm absolutely 100% in favor of pulling those down. They serve absolutely no purpose but to intimidate and spread hate. That's it. If you feel like those monuments shouldn't be destroyed, fine. Put them in a museum. They don't belong on a street corner where people have to walk by them and see them every day. History and monuments, and in their place, they have erected statues to their own gods. What statues? What statues have atheists, I assume she's talking about, or Satan worshipers? What statues have we erected that represent our own gods? We don't have any gods by definition, right? I guess Satan is supposed to be the Satan worshippers' god. Go on. 
the new world order. Wait, what What did the, the text says now the whole world had one language and a common speech. So this is like an intro to right before the Tower of Babel was destroyed. Don't get me started on the Tower of Babel. We'll be here all day. The new world order is here. Another conspiracy theory, the new world order. The new world order is here. And they told us it was coming. Who told you it was coming, Candace? Who said this? I, I didn't see anything about the new world order in the Bible. What are you talking about? It's just a never ending stream of nonsense with this person. It's a battle far greater than what we see in the natural. It is a war between good and evil. Executive order number 10 flashes on screen, demolish the Georgia Guidestones. Demolish the Georgia Guidestones. She obviously is a deep, deep conspiracy theorist to the bottom of her black little heart. If you're not watching, I'll describe what we're looking at if you're in the audio audience. This is Candace Taylor's campaign bus. This is her standing in front of like the RV, the campaign RV. It says, Jesus guns babies on the side. No joke. Jesus guns babies. I'm the one you've been waiting for. Candace Taylor for governor. This is a, a quick and easy way to boil her propagandistic talking points down into three things, isn't it? It is so ridiculous on so many levels. It's impossible to take seriously. Thank Christ the people of Georgia, the good people of Georgia didn't take her seriously either. Like I said, she got like three and a half percent of the vote or something like that. So anyways, what's with the Georgia Guidestones thing? There's this QAnon conspiracy theory that the Georgia Guidestones were erected by Satan worshipers or whatever. So if you don't know what the Georgia Guidestones are, this is a, a picture of them on screen, if you're watching. They were commissioned back in the 60s, I think, maybe, and finally erected in Georgia in the middle of a big field in the 80s. I could have that wrong, but it was back in the late 1900s anyways. They basically have general political ideas on them. It's supposed to help humanity find their way back to building a civilized society in the event of some catastrophic thing happens and society collapses or whatever. We come across these guidestones. I think it can act as a compass and a calendar also because of the way it's built, the way that it's sitting, you know, where the sun shines through it and everything else. It can be used as a compass and a calendar. Here are the 10 inscriptions on the Georgia Guidestones. Maintain humanity under 500 million people in, per in perpetual balance with nature. That's a generally good idea. The, the earth can only handle 2 billion people before we're sucking up more resources than the earth can replenish, basically. It can only handle 2 billion. So maintaining at 500 million is probably a good idea. Not saying we need to, like, get rid of the ones that are here already or something like that. Just saying if society collapses and they find the Georgia Guidestones and they're trying to rebuild society, that's a decent suggestion. Maintain it at no more than 500 million. Number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. That's a weird political idea. I'm not really a fan of that. Sounds like eugenics to me. Unite humanity with a living new language. So basically have one language rather than a bunch. Directly contradicting the Bible. The Bible says God specifically intentionally split people into different language groups because they built a Tower of Babel. So it's basically automatically disregarding anything to do with the Bible. And that's probably part of the reason why so many conspiracies are built around it. Number four, rule, passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. I can agree with that one for sure. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Seems obvious. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Again, obvious. Great idea. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Absolutely, I agree. Love it. Balance personal rights with social duties. 100%. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. I don't know what that means, but okay, I guess if you want. Be not a cancer on earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Okay, great, I guess. Sure, I agree. It sounds like something that some, some weird political and philosophical ideas that some dude had and thought they were deep and so decided to, and had way more money than he had any right to have, so he decided to have these weird stones built. 
I really don't care if he wanted to have those built. Great. I guess some of them are pretty decent ideas. Some of them are questionable. Uh, whatever. Who cares, right? Candace Taylor cares. And QAnon cares. There are so many conspiracy theories about the Georgia Guidestones, it's ridiculous. Again, we don't actually know who commissioned them, but we know who built them. They have the blueprints and everything. They sent the blueprints to, like, an office and paid them, and these people, like, carved it out of marble or something, and they put it in, like, ten different languages or something like that, just in case the person who comes across these stones, you know, in the event of complete societal collapse doesn't speak English— they'll be able to read it in their language too. So I wanted to just take a quick glance at this article on the Daily Beast about the Georgia Guidestones conspiracy. The title is Georgia Governor Candidate Builds, well, gubernatorial is the word, and I get very upset when people don't use it because I absolutely love that word. Georgia gubernatorial candidate builds campaign on demolition of satanic tablets, quote unquote. Satanic tablets, of course, being the Georgia Guidestones. This was written by Will Sommer, On May 13th, 2022, Georgia's Republican primary for governor has revolved around Donald Trump's attempts to oust Governor Brian Kemp over Kemp's refusal to break election laws in the aftermath of the 2020 election. Like I said, Brian Kemp won the Republican primary for governor in Georgia, so this is a moot point now. But the fact that she's running in the first place, the fact that she had the kind of sway that she needed to get a high quality or high production quality campaign ad like this and air it on TV like she did. That's reason enough to talk about this woman, in my opinion. Anyway, let's keep reading. Last week, third place candidate Candace Taylor tried to inject an issue of her own into the race, introducing a plan to blow up four giant granite tablets. Oh, it's granite, not marble. My mistake. Four giant granite tablets in northeast Georgia she sees as symbols of Satan worship. On May 2nd, Taylor unveiled a draft executive order related to the Georgia Guidestones, a set of enormous rocks in the city of Elberton. Taylor's proposed order is simple. Demolish the Georgia Guidestones. The New World Order is here, and they told us it was coming, Taylor said in a video, showing her standing defiantly in front of the tablets she describes as symbols of human sacrifice. This is a battle. To most people not steeped in the online lore that surrounds them, the Guidestones might appear to only be a tourist trap a two-hour drive northeast from Atlanta. Erected in 1979, the 19-foot-tall Guidestones, true origins and purposes are unclear. Again, it's not like a a big mystery. We just don't know who paid to have them put up or who wrote the inscriptions or whatever. We know the company that was commissioned to do it. We just don't know who the client was. It's not this big, crazy secret or whatever. It's not like a cabal of Satan worshippers paid to have them put up. Based on the messages on the Guidestones and their design, though, the people involved in the stone's construction have said that they're meant to help a human remnant rebuild in the aftermath of nuclear war. I'm not completely convinced they would survive nuclear war, but okay. Either way, the Guidestones are likely safe for now. Despite endorsements from Trump allies like MyPillow founder Mike Lindell and pro-QAnon lawyer Lynn Wood, Taylor is polling a distant third in the gubernatorial race behind Kemp and Trump's pick, former Senator David Perdue. Taylor received just 4% in a recent poll, and that's what she got, ultimately. She only got 3.5% of the vote. But her proposed executive order highlights the far right's increasing hostility to the Guidestones, which have taken an outsized importance among conservative conspiracy theorists as a symbol of a nefarious plot to kill off 95% of the world's population. Yeah, this is a QAnon conspiracy theory, the idea that this whole depopulation thing. It's a QAnon conspiracy, and the fact that it's on Guidestones here makes them believe it even harder. It's absolutely ridiculous. So she releases this video after the election ended. Early June 2022 is when this comes out. Listen to this one. This is her address of the nation after she got 3.5% of the vote in the primary. We're not even talking between a Democrat and a Republican right now. We're just talking two Republicans trying to get the nomination to run against a Democrat in November. She didn't even get to that point. She got 3.5% of the Republican vote in the Republican primary. Listen to her response to that news. I wanted y'all to know that I do not concede. I do not. And if the people who did this and cheated are watching, 
again, she's going down the same exact path as Trump. She saw it work for Donald Trump. She saw these people get radicalized on his behalf, and she thought she could weaponize them against her opponent once again. Absolutely disgusting. This is how you destroy democracy, by the way. That's what she's trying to do. She's trying to weaponize democracy against itself. She knows she didn't win. She had no chance of winning the election, of winning the nomination. She had no chance. Her poll numbers were 4%, and she got 3.5% in the end. She knows she didn't win. If the people who did this and cheated are watching, I do not concede. And the people of Georgia will not allow me to. I want you to feel inside of your gut a righteous anger for justice. I feel a righteous disgust at the fact that she is trying to weaponize democracy against itself. She is doing everything she can to destroy it, to tear it down. I want you to pray specifically, specifically, I want you to pray for dark to be brought to light, for justice for the state of Georgia. Here's my question. She's addressing, I don't know how many people, maybe 100,000 people saw this, right? 100,000 of her voters specifically saw this. So we'll say 100,000 far right wing nuts decide to pray for her. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot of prayer. It seems to me with all these people praying, God would get the hint and do it if that was the right thing to do. If you don't take the nomination now, it means God doesn't want you to be part of the government. Is that a fair assumption? You are asking people to pray for you. That means God has heard it, and he knows you want to be in there. Let his will be done. If you don't win the governorship, or if you don't win the nomination, that means God didn't want it. She's not going to accept that as an answer, because she's more obsessed with holding power than anything. And anyone who has helped contribute to this crime, to this travesty, anyone who's contributed to this, I want you to pray that they feel so guilty they come forward. God can do anything he wants to. So we pray for guilt. That's absolutely grotesque. The fact that she is weaponizing people's religious fears and their belief, their misguided belief that Trump actually won the 2020 election. She's weaponizing that stuff against democracy. Like I said, she only got three and a half percent. I don't think she's doing that much damage just because she doesn't have that much sway in the first place. But she's not doing zero. She's certainly doing some. There are certainly some voters out there who heard her say this who are that much more pissed off at the fact that she lost, that much less willing to believe in our election system because of what she just said. So here's my question. Does she actually believe that there was fraud in her case, or is she just trying to weaponize it against democracy? Let me know in the comments. The Guidestones were commissioned by a white supremacist. See John Oliver's rocks. Interesting. Have not heard that. Some good ideas, some bad ideas. Generally, just conspiracy theories abound. I wonder if they would believe that the Georgia Guidestones were as bad as they believe they are if they knew they were from a white supremacist. That'd be interesting, right? Suddenly they flip and they're like, well, you know, this guy isn't so bad. Maybe I'm kind of seeing his point here. Next, we're going to talk about Hank Kuhneman, prophet of God, explaining why he was actually right when he prophesied that Trump would win the 2020 election. And he's right now when he says Trump will get two additional terms. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Hank Kuhneman has built his entire brand off of loving Donald Trump. In 2016, he prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win the election. And of course, that gave him the misguided idea that he was capable of hearing prophecy from God. So he goes on to prophesy in 2020 from God 
that Donald Trump is going to win that election too. And guess what? It fell flat, of course. And the guy cannot give up on it. July 4th, I believe, July 4th, 2021, he goes on this panel with a bunch of other supposed quote unquote prophets who also prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win the 2020 election. And they just stood up there complaining about how they were correct all along and you're wrong and this is the Trump test and blah, blah, blah. And I thought it would be kind of interesting to listen to what they had to say. This one specifically is about Hank Kuhneman, but I'm doing other segments about some of the other people. And if you're interested in seeing the entire thing, I talk about it on Twitch. It may already be up there. And I upload it to my Telltale Unfiltered channel afterwards. So keep a lookout in both those places if you want to see the whole hour, hour and a half long panel discussion between these prophets where they just scream at, scream at the audience and scream at each other about how wrong everybody is to doubt them when they said that Trump was going to win the 2020 election. It's honestly hilarious and entertaining as hell. So anyway, let's get into the Hank Kuhneman stuff. Like I said, July 4th, 2021 is when this one came out. He had some interesting things to say in this clip. Listen to this. I want to say this. For just a moment, Psalm 72 verse 14 declares that God is the God that redeems us from oppression, fraud, and violence. Okay, I don't, I feel like I should look this verse up because I don't remember God saying anything about fraud. Maybe I'm wrong. What was the verse? For just a moment, Psalm 72 verse 14. Psalm 72 14, okay. Okay, here we go. It says, okay. <laughs> This is kind of amusing, actually. Uh, it doesn't say that. Let's just pull this up. Let's pull this bad boy up, see what it says. Huh. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Weird. Did he just intentionally insert words into the Bible? Did he just misquote the Bible intentionally to his own ends? I feel like the Bible says something about that, doesn't it? God is the God that redeems us from oppression, fraud, and violence. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not seeing the word fraud in this verse anywhere at all. That's weird. Somebody should write to this guy. Send him a letter and tell him, I think you got this verse incorrect. Fraud isn't in there anywhere. The Amplified Bible says oppression and fraud and violence. The Gargoyle Samurai. Thank you. I appreciate the super chat. Really? Interesting. Is it a different version? What was it? Let me look. What was it you called it? Um, Amplified Bible. Okay, yeah, here we go. Amplified Bible. It's called AMP. Psalm 72, 14. He will redeem their life from oppression and fraud and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. Interesting. That's really interesting. It's weird because I didn't think his church used that version of, uh, used that version of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I think he's pretty dead set on using the King James Version. Most of these apostolic slash Pentecostal or even non-denominational megachurch pastors like Hank Kuhneman live and breathe the King James Version. They believe it's the only version. It's the most correctest of versions. They won't read any other version, any other translation, because they think all the rest are wrong. So I find it interesting that there is one single version of the Bible that uses the word fraud. You know what? Let me just look it up in the interlinear version. The interlinear version of the Bible allows us to look up a verse and look at the Greek or the Hebrew, the original language, and look at the original actual words that were used in the Bible at that time. So we're looking for Psalms 72.14. Here are the exact words. This is a direct translation. It's not trying to make it easier for an English reader to understand like the majority of the Bible does. In his sight, their blood and shall be precious, their life he will redeem and violence from oppression. I don't know where the Amplified Version got the word fraud from, but it is nowhere to be found in the original language used in the Bible. The word fraud doesn't belong in there anywhere. And it's not in the King James Version either, as far as I know. Let me look that up. Just to be sure, this is the King James Version. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. No mention of fraud. That's the version that most of these preachers, most of these televangelists use, the King James Version. I'm really not sure why he chose to use one obscure specific translation that isn't even actually correct based on the actual original language, probably because it backed up his narrative. 
Obviously, the guy leans into the whole fraud narrative about the election. He thinks it was stolen from Trump. He absolutely has to believe that because if he doesn't believe that, it means he's a false prophet. And according to the Bible, he deserves to be stoned. So he has to believe there was fraud in the 2020 election or he has to believe he deserves to be stoned. J.E., Deuteronomy 13 and 18, false prophets. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22, Moses continued, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you yourselves requested of the Lord your God when you were assembled at Mount Sinai. You said, Don't let us hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, or see this blazing fire, or for we will die. Then the Lord said to me, what they have said is right. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I'll put my words in his mouth and he will tell the people everything I command him. Convenient, right? One guy telling the group of Israelites what God wants from them. Really convenient. Give me all your money. God says to give me all your money. Super convenient that one guy gets to be the person who communes with God. Anyway, I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages the prophet proclaims on my behalf, but any prophet who falsely claims to speak in my name or who speaks in the name of another God must die. There you go. That's Deuteronomy 18. 20. But you may wonder, how will we know whether or not a prophecy is from the Lord? If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. That prophet has spoken without my authority and need not be feared. Quote, unquote. That's the punishment for somebody who claims to be a prophet who isn't. And that's how you can tell he's not. If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. Pretty clear. To me, it seems pretty clear. I don't see how that could be misinterpreted. Hank. This will begin to take place. The other thing that God has been specifically speaking, this is the 245th year of America's reign. And I believe that it represents two more terms for 45. Two more terms. Two more terms. He believes Trump is going to get two additional terms. To what he already had. That means three. Unconstitutional, by the way. I feel like it's been proven without a shadow of a doubt at this point. These types of people do not care about the Constitution. They only want to use it for as much as they can get out of it. They do not care what it has to say otherwise. Or two terms for 45. Oh, there's him hedging. When he doesn't get three terms, he's going to say, well, God said two or three. He didn't tell me he was going to get two additional ones. It is so bizarre how these people think, honestly. So the dude made a failed prophecy, and now he gets super defensive over anybody who might even suggest that he's a false prophet. And naturally, I mean, uh, theologically, he's supposed to believe that he deserves to be stoned for these false prophecies. I'd be defensive too. This is why you don't make false prophecies, Hank. Don't claim to be speaking for God when you're not. The Spirit of the Lord says, why is there so much fear that has gripped the hearts of those who have listened to the voice of my prophets? Why is there so much fear that's gripped the hearts of those who listen to the voice of my prophets? Okay. Why, why are Hank's fans so afraid? Is that what he's trying to say? For they have listened to the sound of lying spirits that have spoke in this time and in this age. He's speaking like he's reading out of the Bible. He's speaking like he has a Middle English accent or, or Middle English grammar or verbiage or whatever. Because he wants it to sound like it's coming straight out of the King James Version of the Bible. FYI, the Bible wasn't written originally in Middle English. Originally, it was written in Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek and some other languages, I think. So I don't know why you're using this Middle English thing to make people think you're speaking with God's voice, but whatever. So he's saying his fans are afraid because they think that he's a false prophet. Is, am I reading that correctly? Because his fans have started listening to the outside world, realizing that Hank really is a false prophet. But yet my and has not been void from this nation or the earth, and it is the spirit of truth. Of course, he's speaking 
for God right now. This isn't Hank Kuhneman speaking. This is God speaking through Hank. That's what he wants you to think. Listen to this again. But yet my spirit is God's spirit. And has not been void from this nation or the earth. And it is the spirit of truth. So God's spirit is still on earth. And it's the spirit of truth. So the people who came to realize that Hank is full of it should continue to believe Hank, I guess, is what he's saying, right? It's really hard to parse what he's saying when he's using Middle English like this. Therefore, I have brought this meeting. For it is I that have declared that you would gather in the place, the music capital of this nation. They're in Nashville for this meeting, by the way. That's what he's talking about there. Because sound always proceeds manifestation, says the living God. So I guess Hank is saying, oh my God, this is hard to parse. Like, come on, use English, Hank. We're using English. You don't need to speak like you're trying to read a verse from the Bible. Nobody believes that you're a prophet. Well, that's not strictly true. A lot of people believe that he's a prophet, so. Therefore, there shall come from this night forward, an acceleration of my hand. Oh God, he's doing another prophecy. Therefore, from this night forward, there will be an acceleration of my hand. Again, he's speaking for God with God's voice. So he's saying that God is going to move from this moment forward. Again, this is July 4th, 2021. I'm not seeing the effects of whatever you're claiming was gonna happen, but okay, let's keep listening. Look to the sound of the fireworks as they lit up and sound throughout your skies this day and even following. For it is the sound of the cracking of my fist that shall break the strongholds that have been upon a previous time and a previous era. Again, this is all intended to sound like it's coming straight out of the Bible. And this is happening on July 4th, which is why he's making references to fireworks. So the fireworks on July 4th were actually the sound of God's fists cracking against each other, a brick wall. I don't know what. So I guess we're to believe that God made something special happen on July 4th, that he drew the line and said, that's it. We're going to make something happen now for sure this time. And Hank Kuhneman, of course, is prophesying this. He's not the only defensive one when it comes to false prophecies like he did. Kent Christmas, Pastor Kent Christmas, which, by the way, is the one who created this panel event that we're watching right now. Pastor Kent Christmas gets pretty defensive over this stuff, too. This one is a new one from Kent Christmas, June 2nd, 2022. Listen to Kent Christmas talking about how wrong you are if you think that the prophet's weren't right when they predicted that Trump would win. When they were eating their babies in Samaria and said, even if God opened the windows of heaven, this could not be. Yeah, I I didn't need to include that first sentence that he said, but I just want to point out that little eating babies thing. People make jokes about atheists eating babies or Satanists or whatever. They really do believe that. They really deeply, truly do. We make jokes about it. They're not joking when they say this. They really believe Satanists and atheists and Jews and all that eat babies. For all of those in my body that have mocked the prophets. My body. He's, again, he's using God's voice right now. He's speaking for God. That have mocked the prophets. All of those that have said on television and said they shall apologize. Know this, I don't apologize. And my prophets don't apologize. But know this, saith the Lord. When I fulfill my word by lepers, hallelujah, as it were. And the blessing of God is released upon this nation. They shall not partake of it. So he's threatening to punish anybody who demands an apology from these pastors who claimed to prophesy Donald Trump's 2020 election victory and obviously got it wrong. Speaking with God's voice, he says anybody who says they should apologize because they got it wrong won't get to have... How did he say they were going to be punished? This nation, they shall not partake of it. And though they repent, and though their soul can be saved, they are permanently disqualified, says the Lord, from being used in leadership in the last move of the Lord. So when the end comes, which it's supposed to be here, you're not going to be allowed to take part in any kind of leadership 
role or whatever if you demand an apology from these people for getting it wrong, for objectively getting it incorrect. They said Trump was going to win the 2020 election. It was ordained by God. And guess what? He didn't. Objectively, without a shadow of a doubt, they were wrong. Anyway, point is, Hank Kuhneman isn't the only one that's defensive. So is Kent Christmas. So is Robin Bullock. All of them are, honestly. Everybody on this stage is defensive about it. Mario Murillo, Todd Coconato, Tim Dixon. I- I'm just listing them from right to left. Kent Christmas, Hank Kuhneman, Robin Bullock, and this is Dutch Sheets on the left. And then the, the host is Gene Bailey. All of them at one point or another, with maybe the exception of Gene Bailey, because I don't know if he considers himself a prophet or not. He's just the host. All of them on this stage prophesied. Not predicted. Prophesied. God spoke through them, and said Trump is going to win the 2020 election. And that's what this whole event that they're holding is about, proving the naysayers wrong. The only thing that could prove it wrong to me is if Trump was actually in office from 2020 to 2024. He hasn't been. He's not going to be. They were wrong. Be as defensive as you want. You were incorrect. So like I said, this was a panel, right? And everybody thought that Hank was done. That was like the last thing that he had to say right at the end there. But this is a new era, says the Lord. So he sits down and he's breathing real heavy and just kind of being quiet there. And then the host comes in and he says this. Robin. Robin. He's, he's given Robin Bullock a chance to speak next. Robin. Pray. Oh, God, he's not done. Okay. Jeez, I thought Hank Kuhneman was done. He's just kind of sitting there being quiet, and all of a sudden he says, pray. Pray. Pray, says the living God. Yes. For they would even desire to strike this nation with an act of... Mm. To divert the attention from what is about to be restored and what is about to be celebrated. What he's saying is the Democrats would strike the nation with with an attack or something with the intent to divert people's attention. Something I've noticed about these prophets, Hank Kuhneman, Dutch Sheets, people like that, everything that they accuse their enemies of doing, it turns out usually they were the ones doing it. That's why they suggested it in the first place. It's all projection, all the way down. The things they accuse their enemies of doing, it usually turns out they were doing. From what is about to be restored and what is about to be celebrated, they are afraid for the cards are already falling, the dominoes are already in place. The cards are falling, the dominoes are in place. Great. Show us. The cards are falling, so I guess that means that Trump is on his way back into office right now, before 2024? Is that what you're telling me? Awesome. Show me evidence of that. I'll believe it instantly. You just have to show me evidence. That is all I need. They never come with that, do they? Never. Those are already in place, and God says they seek to create a diversion. But your prayers that prayed that caused 45 to be elected... It's the same prayers. Your prayers that caused Trump to be elected. Well, they didn't, uh, just to be fair. I mean, I want to put that on record. The prayers didn't work, obviously, because he's not in office. I'm just saying. Okay, go on, Hank. The prayers that caused Trump to be elected. To be elected is the same prayers that I will stop and I will expose the hand of terror that would seek to strike even through your summer. The Lord says, I will listen and I will restrain if my people shall pray. Again, I wish he would just use regular old standard run-of-the-mill English rather than the type of Middle English you tend to find in the Bible. Just lay it on the line and use regular English, please. I'm begging you. Dude's like impossible to understand when he does that. You know what he'd say to that? If you were a man of God, you would have no problem understanding it. These people are absolutely... These people are caricatures of themselves at this point. This next clip I've got, he was mid-prophecy. He was giving a message from God to the audience. 
listen to the words that God wanted to communicate to everybody else in this next one. And God says, listen closely this night. Not only has my finger being put upon this nation, but look at my... Not only has my finger being put upon this nation. You'd think God would be capable of getting things grammatically correct, right? I mess up grammar all the time. I don't claim that God is speaking through me. Upon this nation, but look at my thumb. I am causing there to be fingerprints of evidence and trails that shall lead to their demise and to great exposure that shall bring great reversal, says the Lord. Okay, so God is causing fingerprints to be all over everything. Great. Show me the fingerprints. Prove it. You're claiming to have evidence of all this stuff. Show it to me. They never, ever actually produce the evidence. Have you ever noticed that? They just vaguely gesture at evidence and claim it's there. It's never presented to anybody. You know, they did actually have evidence to present originally in this whole Trump court case thing. They actually brought evidence to the courts, and it was so piss poor, the courts rejected it. They said, you need something solid, something real. What you're giving us is worthless. It's hearsay at best what they were presenting. They tried to give over affidavits, signed affidavits, basically a piece of paper that says... I saw this happen, and it was signed by some rando. That's what it was. The court said, we need something harder than that. That's nonsense. Until you bring it to us, we're not accepting the case. That's basically what happened in 2020 with all of the election cases. The courts threw all of them out because they were nonsense. Because the Republicans presented nothing but nonsense. They don't have evidence. They never had evidence. That's what it would take to convince people. I guess you can do it the cheap way like they're doing it, which is to say, claim God is speaking through you, but you're only going to get a small subsection of the population with that little charlatan's trick. And it'll not just be my thumb, but pay attention to thumb drives that shall shift you into the momentum of what I have been declaring that by the end of this year, you will see that I am the God that has stood by you, for you, and brought you through, says the living God. Okay, we should be watching for thumb drives. Interesting. When you show it to me, I'll believe it. Simple as that. I don't believe anything without evidence. Nothing. Like I said, this was on July 4th, 2021. This is not anywhere near the first time that he did this. In fact, there's a clip from my channel trailer. I don't know if you guys have seen my channel trailer or not, but there's a clip from it of Hank Kuhneman doing something like this. Doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on this position. This is from early January 2022. Listen to this. You know, there's people now, they're now calling out the prophets again. Again? No, I've been calling out the prophets since day one, man. They're ranting again that the prophets were wrong like they are right. And I want to say this. If you're one of those and you're saying that the prophets are wrong and that you're right. That's us. That's us. Okay, go on. What do you want us to do, Hank? Would you do me a favor? Would you go on video and go on record? Put your hand on your Bible and then say, thus saith the Lord. That you heard from the Lord and your witnesses, your hand is on your Bible, that you heard from the Spirit of God that the prophets missed it. Okay, so he wants us to swear on the Bible that we are also prophets and God speaks to us directly because he's a prophet and he speaks to him directly. We can't contradict Hank unless we are also prophets. Actually, we can contradict you. According to the Bible, Hank, if you get something wrong, which you objectively, factually did, then we should pay no mind to you. I think that's in Deuteronomy. We shouldn't be alarmed. We shouldn't even listen to you. You're full of it. You're not a prophet of God. God hasn't spoken through you. That's what the verses say. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it says you should be stoned for acting like a false prophet, for claiming to hear the voice of God when you didn't. I don't need God to tell me if you were right or wrong. I just need to look at the objective facts to tell that you were, in fact, wrong without a shadow of a doubt. 
again, I've already covered this. If you want to see it, it's on my channel, and I'll link it in the description of this clip. But that's Hank Kuhneman. Since 2016, he's been doing some variation of this. You should have seen him strutting around like he owned the place in 2016 when Trump won the election. No thanks to him. Not like he had anything to do with Trump's victory. And then 2020, I, I guess the 2016 election gave him the confidence he needed to make all kinds of outrageous claims, overstep his boundaries in 2020 and make ridiculous claims, which ended up biting him in the ass in the end, obviously. And now he has to find some way to make up for that. So here's my question for you. Does he believe he was right or is he just trying to rehabilitate his reputation? Let me know in the comments. Next, we're going to talk about Prophet Mario Murillo telling us that Satan showed up in his bedroom one night and told him he was going to gender bend his kids. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Pastor and televangelist Kent Christmas held an event recently where he got these six prophets of God on stage with him, basically a panel of prophets, and they were going to talk about God or whatever. They're going to prophesy in God's name. And it turned into a gigantic Trump stroke fest, basically. The last person to speak at the event was Mario Murillo, so I wanted to just listen to Mario Murillo, see what he had to say. If you're unfamiliar with the guy, he is a hardline Trump supporter. I mean, you can see it in his eyes. Look, just God, look at his look at his eyes. He, you know, this guy is a hardline Trump supporter, right? He had some bizarre stuff to say, including but not limited to. He confronted Satan recently. Satan came to his bedroom and told him that he was Satan was personally going to gender bend, quote unquote, Mario Murillo's kids. So let's listen to this first clip here. He went to talk originally, like the, the host, Gene Bailey, was like, okay, your turn, Mario. Go ahead and give us prophecy or whatever. And Mario is about to. He puts the mic up to his mouth. He's going to talk, right? And then this guy starts speaking in tongues in the background. Listen. You can finish it up. You welcome Mario Murillo. <laughs> so he puts the mic up to his mouth. Some guy speaking in, speaking tongues in the background, apparently, and, and it looks like Mario's upset by that or something, right? It, is he upset by somebody speaking in tongues? Go ahead, Mario. The guy's like, oh, okay, I guess Jesus doesn't want me to speak in tongues right now, okay. As uh, we are all here on this strange 4th of July, the strangest that America has known because we've never endured a fraud election before. This is propaganda. I feel I have to address it line by line. I'm just going to say there was no fraud election. This is complete nonsense. Mario Murillo bought into it, I think. I don't even know if he believes it. I don't know. He was one of the people who predicted or I'm sorry, didn't predict, prophesied that Donald Trump was going to win the 2020 election. So I have to imagine he felt compelled to go with the whole fraud narrative because he had no other choice. It's either that or believe that he deserves to be stoned. So anyway, needless to say, there was no fraud election. This guy just doesn't want to believe that he deserves to be stoned. We've never been in a position where it was so clear that we were under the lash of a rogue government. Oh, give me a break. You, Mario Murillo, Christian nationalist, evangelical, are under the lash of a rogue government? Please, tell me how. Tell me exactly how you're oppressed by the government. Mario Murillo, evangelical, Christian nationalist. He goes full fear-mongering mode after that. He jumps right into claims about Joe Biden. Listen to this. I want you to understand what I do. I preach the gospel. There'll be a devil worshiper, a transsexual, an atheist. 
Oh, okay. It's getting weird now. I just want to say, uh, for the record, he does not preach the gospel, actually. He distorts and perverts the Bible in large part. This is not your traditional version of Christianity, really. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholics and every other denomination out there, they really are not like you. They really aren't. I feel like people don't fully understand how different these people are, or these people's beliefs are. It's like a witchcraft cult. They believe that they have the same powers that witches do. Fortune-telling, divining, creating things out of nothing, like all of it. Everything that the Bible describes witches doing, or every piece of lore that 17th century people believed witches could do, they believe they can do it too. It's just under the power of God. That is literally, in their mind, the only difference between themselves and witches. They believe they are witches for God. Th this specific brand of evangelicalism. They are not like you, Catholics. They are not like you, Mormons. It is a witchcraft cult. That includes Hank Kuhneman, Kenneth Copeland, Robin Bullock, Mario Murillo, Greg Locke, they all believe this way. It is totally different than what you think it is. And you don't realize that until you start digging into it. But I'll prove that even more in a couple of minutes. Wait till the end of this compilation. I have something that'll add to this. Keep listening. I want you to understand what I do. I preach the gospel. There'll be a devil worshiper, a transsexual, an atheist. And I'll speak to them like I'm going to speak to you for a moment. But everything today is about one thing, the children, your child, my child, your grandchild, my grandchild. We are not going to let them grow up in the prison that Joe Biden wants to build. I didn't see anything in any of Joe Biden's plans for a prison. I haven't heard any mention of prisons. I have no idea what he's talking about right now. It just gets stranger and stranger. We're starting down a, uh, we're starting down a rabbit hole right now. Buckle up. He's trying to rewrite history too. Listen to this next clip. This should give you a clear idea that he is from a religious denomination that is very different from the one that you recognize. America was founded by a group of Christians. I'm gonna try it again. A group of Christians. No, that is incorrect. Again, he's trying to rewrite history. It was not founded by a group of Christians. The founding fathers were deists at best. I'm gonna try it one more time. A group of Christians. And when they landed on these shores, they didn't pray to Baal. They didn't pray or make an atheistic document. Yes, they did. Uh, the Constitution is completely outside of religion. It doesn't contain, it specifically says religion should be separate from the state. So I guess you could say they did kind of make an atheistic document. They said this land is sacred under Jehovah God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's kind of weird, right? Under Jehovah God? I don't remember the Founding Fathers saying anything about that, first of all. And second, Jehovah is not God's name, and nearly no denominations believe it is. Jehovah's Witnesses are unique in the fact that they believe that Jehovah is God's name. Jays didn't exist when the Bible was written. Jays didn't exist in the Hebrew language. That's the only piece of evidence that I need to prove to you that Jehovah isn't God's name. But I'll go further. There used to be this superstition about God's name, like long and long ago. Um, ancient Jews believed that it was wrong to say God's name. And the ancient Hebrew language didn't have vowels originally. It wasn't written with vowels. All they had were consonants. So the tetragrammaton in the Bible is the four letters that represent God's name. Of course, because it doesn't have vowels. It was originally Y-H-W-H. That's what the tetragrammaton was originally. As time went on, again, Jews had this superstition that you weren't supposed to say God's name. So what they did, since they were standing there reading from these texts, they didn't want somebody to accidentally say it out loud. So what they did was they added the vowels for the word 
Adonai, which means Lord. Later, like after vowels were added to the language, they added in the vowels for Adonai, which are the vowels were A, O, and A. I was at the end, but we don't count the last vowel because we didn't need all four of them. So the vowels for Adonai were A, O, A. So what they did was they inserted those vowels into the Tetragrammaton because they knew for facts that's not the right name. They may as well insert the vowels so that if somebody does accidentally pronounce the name that they come across, it's okay. It doesn't matter. And inserting the vowels for Adonai into the Tetragrammaton, YHWH, made it complete nonsense anyways. It didn't matter. When they inserted the vowels to Adonai into the Tetragrammaton, they ended up with Y-A-H-O-D. W A H Yahowa. Like I said, it was nonsense then, and that's specifically why they intentionally did it. They made it nonsense on purpose so that people wouldn't accidentally pronounce God's real name, which was Yahweh. Centuries later, millennia even, the name eventually passed through the Germanic region, Yahowa. And of course, using a German accent, Ys are pronounced like Js, and Ws are pronounced like Vs. So as it passed through the Germanic region, it morphed into Jehovah. Eventually, when the King James Version of the Bible was written, they actually wrote it down. They put I-E-H-O-V-A originally because, again, J's didn't exist at the time when the King James Version was originally written. As time went on and they released new versions, they eventually changed it to J-E-H-O-V-A-H. But again, there were almost no mentions of the Tetragrammaton in any Bibles because the Jews had this superstition about pronouncing God's name, and they were the ones that were, like, producing the Bibles back before the printing press existed, back before the King James Version even existed. They were using versions of the Bible that were being produced by Jews, or that were originally produced by the Jewish people. So they excluded the Tetragrammaton. Now we have the actual original texts, like in museums and stuff, and we can actually see what it says. We don't have to rely on faulty translations that were miscopied and miscopied and miscopied over the generations. That's why the name, the Tetragrammaton, only appeared in the King James Version Bible like two or three times maximum because it was removed and replaced with my Lord. And the only occurrences said Jehovah because it had passed through Germanic regions. So the correct name to get to the point is Yahweh, not Jehovah. Anyway, let's keep listening to Mario lay incorrect information on us here. He said this land is sacred under Jehovah God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Completely incorrect in every way. There's nothing correct about what he just said. Here's where it gets interesting, though. Leading up to this next clip, he told us that God told him that he needed to get close to the kids, figure out what the kids like, figure out what they're interested in, their style, what drugs they use. No joke. That's what he said. I'm quoting him. And he says, after a long t- uh, what what did he say? After a week of studying everything that our kids are going through. Yeah, after studying the kids for a week, this happens. Listen to this. In, the, in a late night of study, evil entered my room. Uh-oh. It's getting real. And I knew it was evil. The room temperature dropped. It got dark. There was a stench. Can you prove any of this? Are you sure you didn't fall asleep and dream it? How do we know this wasn't a sleep paralysis situation? You know what? I'm not going to poke holes yet. Keep going. And I didn't feel like some underling had been sent to intimidate me. And when the devil spoke, he said, I will take your children. Okay, so the devil shows up in his bedroom late at night and tells him he's going to take his kids. I will have them. I will put them in an early grave. You hear these people say, no, no, in the background. Like, they're honestly worked up over this. Listen to this. I will have them. I will put them in an early grave. I will humiliate them. I will bend their gender. Bend their gender. I mean, he gave us a whole list there, and that's the one that sticks out to me. That is so funny. What does he even mean by that? The only time I've ever heard that term in my life was when I somebody downloaded an app 
and uploaded a picture of me to the app, and it morphed me into looking like a woman instead of a man. That's the only time I've heard of the term gender bending. Is that what he's talking about? Is he saying that Satan is going to produce apps that allow people to see what they would look like if they were a different gender? Because that exists. We didn't need Satan for that. And I will, and I will, and I will. Suddenly the glory of God filled the room, and God said, but I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters. Somebody shout right now. Yes, people are already shouting. You don't have to tell them to shout. This is the cringiest, this is the cringiest shit I've ever seen in my life. It's getting there. I've seen some cringy stuff. This is bad. And they will prophesy. They will prophesy. Somebody help me. We're gonna, they will prophesy. Look, People are speaking in tongues on stage right now. These the, these so-called prophets are speaking in tongues. Oh my God, dude. It just, it doesn't get cringier than this, honestly. It really does not. Guess what he does to finish the whole thing off? He decides to do a faith healing event at the end. Listen to this. So I'm in a tent. The young people are there. They're coming to Jesus and we give him all the glory. Doesn't sound like you gave him all the glory. You're taking credit for the stuff that happened at this. It sounds like you're taking some of the glory. And then this moment will come when the healing power of God will come, like on that man up there in the blue with a heart condition. And God is healing you. Like that one over there, right there, with both migraine headaches, spine that is deeply in pain, your back and your blood are both issues in your body. I, if I had an arm that was long enough, I could tap you on the nose. This is a common faith healing charlatan's trick. Have people fill out prayer cards at the beginning of the event describing what you want them to pray for. What's bothering you in your life? Give the prayer cards to the prophets on stage before the event, and they can call you out by name during the event to make it look like they know what they're talking about, to make it look like they received divine information from God. That's how this little trick works. It's as dirty and underhanded as cold reading by a psychic. And here he sits, suckering people into believing that he has supernatural powers. Again, like a witch. I said this earlier. They really are from a witchcraft cult. They are trying to convince these people that they're capable of seeing the future and receiving secret information that they couldn't have received any other way, fortune-telling kind of stuff. This is a witchcraft cult. Across this auditorium, there are miracles. There are miracles of power. There are going to be medically verified healings as a result of this event. Medically verified. Awesome. Show me. Show me. That's what I need. Show me the proof. You said medically verified, right? So you're testing the entire audience beforehand, then testing them afterward and seeing the medical change, right? Oh, you didn't mean medically verified, did you? You meant, I want you to believe that there are medically verified events, but I'm not going to offer any proof for it. Right. But it won't come unless I clearly state why they're coming. He's going to take all of the things we've prophesied. He's going to take all of the excitement that we've generated. He's going to take all of the insights that we've received and turn us into an actual army. An actual army, you say. Remember, some of the things that were prophesied on stage came from Hank Kuhneman, for example, who claimed that Donald Trump was absolutely for sure going to take back the presidency for two additional terms for a total of three terms, which means our democracy will be non-existent. It'll be destroyed at that point because that's unconstitutional. Hank Kuhneman prophesied all kinds of bizarre stuff on this stage. And Mario Murillo is standing here telling us God's going to turn these people in this room right now into a, a literal army, he said, a literal army to make those prophecies happen. I mean, think about how concerning that is. The rhetoric these people are using, they're actually saying they want their Christian followers to turn into an army to make their political wishes come true. Keep listening, it gets more disturbing. To an actual army. 
that will function in what we've heard, that will trigger. And I'm going to tell you something that you need to understand. I thought you were a remnant, but I was wrong. Remnant is a reference to a Bible verse that talks about how the church will be fractured or something like that, and the remnant will rise up, and blah, blah, blah. Because there are more of us than the devil ever imagined. America, listen to me. This army of God is going to be raised up with weapons of power. They're going to march. They're going to move forward. They're going to get out of their safe houses and they're going to change America. Is that concerning to anybody else? Pretty concerning to me. An actual army. It sounds like what this guy is doing is planning sedition or planning treasonous action, forming a mobile militia against the U.S. government. Is that not what he's doing right now? Please make it make sense. So here's the point. Healing virtue is going to flow in this room. Hundreds of you will be healed. Many of you, I could call you out right now. I'm telling you, this man's shoulder right down there, he literally fell, landed on his right side, excuse me, left side. How many of you know it's one or the other? <laughs> left side damaged his shoulder, his neck, his hip, and his entire leg. Again, common charlatan's trick to make people think that he has divine information from God. He's being healed by the power of God right down there. You know who you are. Scoliosis, multiple sclerosis, cancer of the throat, cancer of the lungs. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Prove it. That's all I need. A little proof. Here's what God is saying. It's coming because of Acts chapter 14, verse 3. And God proved that their message was from him by giving them power to work great miracles. Interesting. God proved that it was through him by giving them power to work great miracles. Great. Now all we need is that actual proof. Just give it to me. I'm waiting. I'll take it. Anything. In the name of Jesus, pray in the language of the Holy Spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name above every name, let healing power fall on this crowd and remove tumors, remove pain in every aspect of the body, hepatitis C, cancer, diabetes, Paralysis after effects of COVID. In the name of Jesus. Grotesque. Absolutely grotesque. I'm surprised he even mentioned after effects of COVID. I wasn't sure if he was one of the evangelicals who believes that it's a total hoax, that it's not even real, or if he was one that believed that the government orchestrated the whole thing. At the very least, he believes it's real, so I guess he probably believes the government orchestrated it. I mean, who knows? So here's my question for you guys. Does this guy really believe he's capable of faith healing? Does he actually think he's capable of removing somebody's paralysis? Or is he full of it? Let me know in the comments. Rosalie Bent. American churches are unrecognizable to Christians like me and the rest of the world. They are nothing like us. I agree. I agree. Honestly, I, I don't like to engage in the no true Scotsman fallacy. As a matter of fact, I believe they are Christians. They claim to be Christians. That makes them Christians. But it really is very different. It's a completely different denomination with completely different beliefs and tenets and ideas of everything totally different. Again, I feel like if people recognize that, they would not put up with them being in political power. They're not trying to help you, they're trying to help them. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues 
issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.